good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Elliott School for International Affairs here at North Washington University. My name is Jennifer Cook. I direct the Institute for African Studies um, here at the Elliott School. The, uh, the Institute serves as something of a hub for debate, discussion, research, activities uh, uh, across the university, uh, connecting faculty, students, researchers, uh, policymakers and others uh, invested and interested in Africa in the Washington community. We are delighted to welcome you here today to um, this event, Africa's Future, Universities Partnerships, Business, Technology, and Open Diplomacy. Uh, we are just one of uh, multiple partners and we're just delighted to join um, with, with these partners, a USC Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy, Howard University Center for African Studies, the Public Diplomacy Council, uh, the University of Witwatersrand's uh, African Center for the Study of the United States, the Institute for Public Policy and Global C Communications here at the Elliott School, and of course the Institute for African Studies. Uh, we hold this just uh, as after the Africa Leaders Summit, uh, which brought some nearly 50 leaders, heads of state from Africa to Washington this past week, concluded last night. Um, the summit uh, really aimed to revitalize U.S.-Africa partnerships at a time in which it's increasingly clear that the United States has an important stake in Africa's success and that the continent will play a vital role in addressing some of the, uh, the, uh, the world's most vexing challenges. Uh, some of the headline outcomes that I think we'll probably hear from Jed, De Jed Devermont shortly, uh, 55 billion uh, invested over the next three years, a promising to my mind push for uh, greater equity in global governance, an initiative on digital uh, transformation that uh, it pushes for greater access and literacy, uh, digital literacy in Africa. And then a, a strong and continuing commitment uh, to uh, on health in terms of building a health workforce, in terms of uh, building health systems and infrastructures, and boosting Africa's pharmaceutical capacity. All of this, to some extent, depends uh, on Congress um, and, and the continued commitment of this uh, administration and subsequent administrations. Um, and we've seen in the past eight years, Africa policy can wax and wane in the, uh, in, in the uh, consciousness of our top uh, policy leaders at certain moments. But I think this is a moment um, uh, that the stake, as I said, becomes increasingly clear. It's also a good, uh, important to note that while policy leadership may change, the kinds of partnerships that we're going to talk about today uh, between institutions outside of government, between people outside of government, are equally important to building a, a long-term, sustained, uh, and positive relationship with Africa. So some of the things we'll talk about today are, are university uh, partnerships, from a U.S. Uh, uh, policy point of view, I think an important part of our soft power globally is the dynamism of our educational system, for example. How do we, um, how do we, it, it, the, the business partnerships that uh, kind of will sustain partnership through uh, uh, mutual self-interest, let's say. Um, people to people diplomacy, we'll hear about some of that. And then technology and digital transformation connect us in, in many different ways. Um, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, um, uh, Gilbert Kadigala from the University of Witzwatersrand, uh, but I'm very look, very much looking forward to today's discussions. Um, and uh, yeah, I will uh, turn to Gilbert. Welcome, Gilbert. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Gilbert Hadiagala. Uh, I'm from the Africa Center for the Study of the United States, which is based at uh, the University of the Midwater Ground in Johannesburg. So I'm privileged to be here uh, on this uh, auspicious event. It's uh, been a long week in town, 
and I think everybody is tired, but I want to thank everybody for actually coming and uh, demonstrating that the theme of this, the week was partnership and how we in fact uh, work on those partnerships uh, is on, in as a matter of course, routinely, because this is important that in fact we demonstrate uh, that Africa-US relationships uh, cannot uh, be sustainable without this cross-cutting uh, partnerships. And I think that's what we wanted to do and inject ourselves in these uh, week's events. Uh, what I want to do is that I don't want to speak about the Africa Center for the Study of the US because I'll have an opportunity to do that where in the coming session when we talk about the kinds of partnerships that Africa has been forging with the United States. But I just wanted to use this opportunity really to thank all the partners who've been involved uh, in this event from the very outset. I also have to say that uh, the two key drivers, some of the two key drivers of this event are not here with us. Adam Powell from USC, uh, who is not able to be with us, but Adam has been with us from the very beginning. But Adam is also uh, the co-chair of the uh, Africa Center for the Study of the U.S. Uh, advisory board. Uh, so he's been actually our key partner in uh, Washington, but also in Southern California. The other person who is not here today is uh, Bob Wekesa, who is my deputy. Uh, Bob was not able to make it. He was supposed to come together, but there were some glitches uh, that prevented him from coming. So I want to thank them alongside uh, Howard University uh, 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 Center for African Studies, which has been very key to bringing us here. And of course, Jennifer with the African Studies, Institute of African Studies here. We're very happy to in fact, partner with you. The Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communications, which is also part of uh, the, the, this university, has been very key in facilitating this event. So I really want, uh, I want to thank them uh, profusely. Uh, we also have worked very closely uh, with uh, specific individuals, uh, with us from the African Studies, at, uh, at Harvard University, uh, Crystal Johnson, I think she's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> it's a And thank you for uh, for being here. Uh, and uh, of course, Jennifer and Adam and Bob. Uh, we got somebody from George Mason University, Mikhail. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, that kind of partnership is actually what makes us, uh, what brings us here. And I think I just want to say from this very early phase that uh, we are very excited that everybody could come in a very busy week. Uh, but I think we need to get uh, started with the day's event so that we can actually end on time. Uh, at this moment, I think the next speaker is going to be our special guest uh, Jad and uh, Jad, thank you very much for coming, uh, the Africa Director at the NSC and uh, Jad, you've done an excellent job even before you went to the NSC, so I want to welcome you to this podium. Thank you very much for coming. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm really happy to be back here uh, at GW. I taught uh, four years uh, of courses here at GW, and um, there's so many friends and colleagues here in this room, uh, so many people that I partnered with when I was at CSIS, including uh, Gilbert and Bob and Jennifer and Krista. So it's great to see a, a bunch of partners. I believe I'm on both sides of, uh, of this podium with you. In, in, my, in my government role. Uh, obviously, we think we had an extraordinary successful summit uh, that just concluded yesterday. Of course, we're still doing events today and there are events that are ongoing. And, and I think that's because beyond the bilats, beyond the outcomes, and Jennifer already stole some of my thunder, uh, but I, 
think what's made this such a success is everything that's happening around the summit as well as what's in the summit. So if you went to the summit webpage every day, there were multiple events all over town, and this is one of those. So thank you for contributing to the success of the summit. You know, the overarching theme of the summit, the overarching theme of the U.S. African strategy is 21st century partnerships. Um, I thought Secretary Blinken summed it up very nicely last night when he said, the United States and African nations can't deliver on any of our fundamental aspirations of our people. We can't solve any of the big problems we face if we don't work together. So our approach is about America can do with the African nations and people, not for them. And I, I think that's the cornerstone of today's conversation as well, right? How do we together shape the future? So I'm gonna say a couple of things about the way the Biden-Harris administration looks at partnerships with Africa. And hopefully that will be a nice framing for um, the rest of the conversation. But, you know, first, who are we partnering with? So of course, governments and leaders, which was a lot of the summit, but it's much more than that. It's civil society, it's institutions, think tanks, advocates, activists, workers, publics, including the diaspora, and of course the private sector, both US and African. It's also about partners that aren't in Africa or in the United States. We've been very uh, intentional about widening the circle. So not just the Europeans, but engaging with the Gulf and India and, and Japan and South Korea, because uh, Africa is integral to our, our community. And the engagement that we can do with multiple partners uh, is really critical if we're going to achieve uh, the goals that we have for each other. The second is what, you know, what are we going to do together? And this could take us all day, but I'll give you some of the ways that I think about it. First of all, it's about deepening engagement. Um, all of the many, many times over the last three days that President Biden uh, met with African leaders, uh, invited them to the White House to talk about elections, saw them in at plenaries, hosted conversations, and the entire cabinet did that. I mean, we pretty much had everyone in the U.S. government working on Africa for the last three days, which is really remarkable. And we've made commitments to continue that. It's my continuing conviction that uh, if we just have three days of an Africa summit and then go back to business as usual, then we probably fail. And so we probably heard last night that not only did President Biden commit to travel to the continent next year, but he committed everyone to, to travel to the continent. So Vice President Harris, First Lady, Dr. Biden, Anthony, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, uh, Administrator of Power, Secretary of Defense Austin, Secretary of Commerce Armando, um, and Linda Thomas Greenfield, our ambassador to the UN. So, and and we're we're going to keep pushing to make sure more and more cabinet uh, officials go to the continent to have engagements with you know both leaders and publics. The and I should just say on this engagement, one of the central elements of the document is that it's okay to have disagreements, right? I think durable solutions start. Uh, with disagreement. So we're able to talk to our partners and disagree or raise our concerns and at the same time talk about the areas of cooperation and fundamental to almost every engagement President Biden's had with African leaders in this administration has been talking about things that we disagree with as well as what we can do together. The second part is elevating African voices. Two of the um, announcements that we're most proud of. One was at the UN General Assembly in September, which is our commitment to African representation of the US Security Council. It's about time. We need more African voices at the table. And also our commitment to support uh, African Union joining as a permanent member of the G20. Currently, only South Africa is a member of the G20. President Ramaphosa asked President Biden to support this. Um, President Macky Sall of Senegal wrote many letters to President Biden at this point as well, so we were really delighted to, to join with them in diversifying, globalizing um, a number of our multilateral institutions. The third is meeting aspirations, meeting the aspirations of the African people. We were very deliberate that the cornerstone of the conversation during the summit was about Agenda 2063, which is the African Union and the African governments and people's vision for what they want for the continent. And so, President Biden spent a lot of time talking to counterparts about their hopes, their focus, what they want for the relationship, and then working together. We also believe very strongly in one of the most important initiatives that have come out of the continent in the last couple of years, which is the African Continental Free Trade Area. And so we signed a memorandum of understanding with them 
uh, with um, the Secretary General, I think that was on Wednesday, um, another, another sign of both how we're working together. We're focused on building capacity. So Jen kind of alluded to some of this, uh, what we're doing at health, a major initiative for African health workers, what we're doing on education, we just put a committed to working with Congress, another $100 million for the Young African Leaders Initiative. Um, you know, throughout the day, you can see in all of these fact sheets, and I had to read them many times, so if you get through them once, good on you. But it has all the things that we are wanting to do to think about health, climate, education, and a whole range of uh, issues that are important to us and our partners. The summit's about, and engagement's about connecting people, connecting businesses. We announced $15 billion of private sector deals on day two of the Business Forum. We announced uh, the President's Advisory Council on African Diaspora Engagement, so we can elevate the work that we do together uh, with our diaspora, which is the vanguard um, of investment, an important source of strength for us, connectivity to the continent, uh, and that's both new African immigrants, second or first or second generation, but historically, the connections that we have um, through through slavery and, and through the history of the Atlantic. And then finally, and I think this kind of gets at what you're talking about today, is we're exploring new frontiers together. I mean, literally, space. Um, it's actually one of my favorite things to tell people about, um, and I, I've written about this in the past, but there's a number of space programs that the African continent um, has launched, and they're not frivolous. Um, they're really about making better decisions about uh, agriculture and investment. The Artemis Accords, which is about uh, another place, obviously, to the reality, to technology, a commitment to $450 million to invest uh, in the new uh, digital transformation of the African program. Finally, we're doing a lot together. One of the things that I'm hoping over days and months people will kind of capture that we did at the summit is we've been working intensely with uh, Mackie Saul's delegation led by Strat Messia. Vera Sangwe, um, Joe Sme, to talk about what we can do on food security together. And we released a joint statement about that. We're really excited because that's the two of us working together from building a roadmap of how we think about addressing the acute needs of the food crisis, but as well as thinking about longer term productivity, resilience, and supply chain. I gave you the, the sort of the who and the what and just a little bit on the why. You say it is a mantra that Africa is going to be critical to addressing the major challenges uh, of our day and our era. And we really believe that if we're going to have uh, a, a rule, a, an international system that is stable, free, open, and secure, Africans are going to be have to be at the table, help define uh, the rules of the road so it works for everyone. And so we're invested in this relationship for all the reasons that have been at the hallmark or at, at, have been critical for our relationships for many years, but because in this moment, this decisive moment, um, it's incredibly important for Africans to be in the United States to be linked to the hip to work together. I'll end um, with one of my favorite moments of the, the, the summit, which is if you caught um, an interview by Mackie Saul uh, with the New York Times, he said, success would be for the United States and Africa to work on concrete programs to offer food security help Africa be self-sufficient through public-private investment funds, help modernize agriculture in Africa, and develop an infrastructure. Energy, roads, rail, irrigation. He said, certainly we'll need a little money, but first, there must be the will to work with Africans. So President Biden answered that yesterday and said, President Saul and every leader around this room, I hope we're making it clear today and every day, it's not just showing the will, but doing the work. And there's a lot of work to be done. So even in this closing remarks to the president, we're having a dialogue. Anyway, I wish you the best for this conference. Uh, it's really exciting. So glad to see so many of my friends and partners here. Thank you. No, I have to get back on what you say. Sorry. Join me again in thanking Dad for, for coming up on both So let's get started with our first session. Uh, we just get Krista on. Um, uh, the first session is about partnerships in a broader generic sense. Uh, more specific sense why we are here. 
And we thought maybe we could just uh, start that discussion with Krista and me. And joining us, Elko will be and Marky from Georgia, from uh, George Mason. Hi. How are you? Should we sit here yeah. or do you, do you want us to speak up there? Uh, wherever you're comfortable with, but I think it would be easier if I sit here. Are you finished? No. Okay. 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 But I'm going to be doing a PowerPoint later. I'm just planning. 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 I'm uh, issue we're addressing on this session is uh, what is partnerships or how do we define US uh, Africa partnerships, uh, particularly from the perspective of universities or institutions of uh, higher learning. And we thought we would just uh, start by Krista and Michael giving us uh, their big pictures around. What partnerships are all about, and how can we think about partnerships? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks um, for our co organizers, um, certainly for GW's Institute of African Studies for hosting us, and, and um, Adam Powell, who unfortunately is not able to join us, but did really all of the <laughs> yeoman's work for pulling this, uh, this whole event together. So I want to certainly uh, thank them and appreciate their commitment to this topic. Um, it's interesting, I, I, um, yeah, we're sitting here at the end of the summit and everybody's kind of still riding high uh, you know, after the summit and there was a lot of um, fanfare over, you know, um, judges you know, kind of outlined for us, tech innovation, investments in you know, digital transformation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, health system strengthening, I got, I got all of those kind of takeaways as well. Um, but it's important, of course, not to forget that it's universities that are, in fact, responsible for much of the basic research and innovation that uh, you know, really drives societies and drives uh, knowledge production. So the, and, and it's interesting, Judd's left, so maybe I can say this, um, that the summit didn't really focus very much on universities in higher education or to the extent that I certainly would have liked. Um, and even just in terms of the, I don't know if there was an official, you know, kind of uh, uh, web page of, of side events, but I think this was probably the only one which explicitly, uh, you know, mentions or you know targets university partnerships, um, which again is a bit unfortunate. There was an announcement in one of the fact sheets um, uh, as part of the Biden administration's new investments in diaspora engagement. Um, to support this new university partnerships initiative, um, which through the Department of Education will provide 1.5 million to facilitate US Africa university exchanges, joint research, collaboration on academic administration, public private partnerships. $1.5 million is paltry. <laughs> um, just to put that in context for you, I'm actually a, a fellow of the Carnegie African Diaspora. Uh, Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program. And uh, so I know that program um, pretty well. It's been rather successful. That's with one of our foundations. They spend $1.6 million each year to you know, build these uh, collaborations and partnerships between diasporan academics and institutions on the continent. So not really very excited, to be honest, about the, um, the announcements that came with regards to university partnerships out of the summit. Um, so uh, the a UNESCO report on knowledge-driven actions transforming higher education for global sustainability states that higher education institutions are uniquely positioned to contribute to the social, economic, and environmental transformations that are required to tackle the world's most pressing issues. Higher education is society's premier marketplace of ideas and of knowledge production and plays a pivotal role in educating democratic citizens and promoting and safeguarding democratic governance. Universities also serve utilitarian purposes of producing human capital and innovation for national economies to be globally competitive. And African institutions in particular have been, uh, historically have, um, uh, 
have had developmentalist imperatives of the post-colonial state or taken on the developmentalist imperatives of the post-colonial state. And you see some of this, much of this echoed in the, um, in the promotion of this idea of a fourth industrial revolution in a number of uh, uh, African institutions. Um, and we all know, of course, that the continent, um, the continent's population is growing and is slated to grow, to reach 25% of the world's population by 2050. Um, and we, of course, know that the African continent has a very useful, youthful population. Yet the overwhelming majority of African youth don't have access to tertiary education. Um, based on some 2020 data, tertiary enrollment, the tertiary enrollment ratio for sub-Saharan African countries is just 9%, and this compares to the world average of 40%, and to the high income countries average of about 79% uh, who have access to tertiary, tertiary education. So UNESCO data shows that uh, there are about 14.6 million tertiary, African tertiary students in 2020, and that represents only 6.6% of the global total. We also know, of course, that African universities suffer significant human capital deficiencies, physical facilities, teaching infrastructure deficiencies, and then quality of graduates uh, in this kind of very fast-paced moving uh, global economy. Um, uh, students are need, need digital skills, they need uh, skills in particular disciplines and disciplines and trades, but also lifelong learning skills so that they're able to easily adapt to, to uh, new circumstances. Um, so I just want to, I guess, highlight maybe three points that I think um, should are important, I guess, considerations as we think about what are the next steps for building university partnerships between the U.S. and African institutions. Uh, and the first is uh, to scale up. I mean, I think many of us, of us were probably interested in hearing some big announcement which was going to really, you know, insert and inject a lot of uh, resources uh, into building us africa partnerships. We didn't see that. But it's also important to recognize and to, to just appreciate that many African, uh, sorry, many U.S. institutions have long-standing relationships with African institutions. So we're not starting from, you know, point zero, right? Uh, my institution, I'm at Howard University, we've been engaged in, on the African continent since before decolonization. And there are many U.S. institutions that came in at the time of decolonization, right? So I have decades, more than 50 years of experience and partnerships collaborating with African institutions. But what we need is a significant scaling up. Right? So it's not that we don't have programs, and we have extremely successful programs, we can all talk about those, um, but it's scaling up. And, and what's also important in this process is these programs have tended to have dispersed impacts. Even the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program that I mentioned before. You know, we target, or YALI for example, we target and we train individuals and that makes Obviously, it makes an, an impact on the individual. It does make an impact on the community. But I think we need to think more synergistically in terms of how do we build more co um, um, collective and collaborative and kind of um, you know, broader have a, a broader impact and not kind of programs that kind of selectively um, benefit particular disciplines or, or particular individuals. We also tend to have more siloed engagement. So. We all know about, you know, Baylor's health. Health is a big issue that they're raising now. You know, Baylor's health programs or HIV AIDS programs in Botswana or Harvard's. You know, yeah, and, and it tends to be very siloed to a particular discipline or a particular field. Now's really, I think, the time to kind of envision or to kind of uh, understand infrastructure. And, and this is where the U.S. government could come in to really kind of provide us with a broader framework in which all of these um, um, engagements can take place. Um, and along these lines, it's actually Paul Zileza, I, I coined from him or took from him, he refers to this idea of a, uh, an ideas ecosystem, right, comprised of universities, think tanks, business, government. Would have been nice for, at this summit, to really hear more of a, an appreciation of the way in which universities will be able to play a role in health system strengthening in African countries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, and then also, you know, again, highlighting the point of 
the need to promote inter-institutional collaborations and consortia, right? So instead of just kind of selectively saying, I'm going to work with this, which we do a wonderful job doing, but think about how we can kind of broaden our uh, impact and our engagement by by developing uh, or working with African consortiums or, or uh, inter, you know, kind of institutional collaborations on the continent, South-South collaborations and North-South collaborations will be key. Uh, so my second point would be to say that we need to move towards inter and transdisciplinarity in our uh, university partnerships in education and research. Again, we can give a number of examples with this. I. Uh, I direct our Center for African Studies. We have a very, we have the largest African language uh, uh, program in, in the country, I will uh, boast. And so that does tend to be a very straight, a significant strength of ours, which you'll hear from one of my colleague actually this afternoon or, or later on, that we've partnered with our School of Business, right, to, uh, to you know, provide to our students not only business skills, you know, critical business skills that they'll need, uh, in the global marketplace, but also the, the African language skills. So thinking about how we can we can develop programming which is more interdisciplinary and more transdisciplinary will be you know, very important. Um, and students are leading the way in this regard. And students don't necessarily see the kind of silo, that I'm sure they see the silos, but they are very eager to break down the silos that I think historically have been there and make these kind of, kinds of connections cross-disciplinary. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that I think that we need to align our um, our U.S.-Africa partnerships, our university partnerships, with continental agendas to build transformative and impactful knowledge. So we have uh, um, the SDG four, um, and UNESCO, as I said, has put out a lot of I think um, you know useful um, uh, guidelines in terms of you know what needs to happen on the continent. Um, the African Union 2063 has an agenda um, uh, you know, framework, CESA, um, that needs to be you know, considered and incorporated as we're moving forward. And, and both of those in particular you know, um, focus on the need to be open to epistemic dialogue and integrating other ways of knowing. As I like certainly what Jed said before, this isn't you know, the kind of idea that, oh, we're going there to train Africans, you know, we have something that you know, skills development that we can provide to them has passed, right? We now really need to understand that Africans have a lot to bring to the table. I can give any number of examples of remarkable innovations that are that are happening, that are initiated at African institutions. And so we just we need to also harness that um, you know that ability. Um, let me stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, thank you for those preliminary remarks. And now we'll move to. Am I pronouncing it correctly? No, it's Michelle. Michelle. Oh. Well, <laughs> Michelle. Good morning. My name is Michelle Malore. I'm the director of external programs at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And I was asked to come here to talk. I guess I'm the micro example of what you've been talking about of some new innovative programming and initiatives. Um, we've created in the last several years, new partnerships in Africa, focusing on global exposure, international comparative education opportunities, and skill building for success in future careers. Pre oh, I've spent more than 25 years in international education and have taken more than 2,000 students to over 30 countries, so to all corners of the globe, including Africa. And in pre-COVID, all of my classes were three credits, they were in-person abroad and designed to be rigorous for our graduate students. The trips were approximately a week long and intensive, uh, since most of our graduate students work full-time and have families, etc. For many, um, it was simply impossible for them to take a two or a three or a month long trip abroad, which is the typical model for um, exchanges in the 90s and before. So the Shar School would typically offer five classes abroad a year um, for many years and almost always included a uh, class in Africa. In fact, my, one of my signature and favorite classes, which I ran almost yearly, was in South Africa. But our planning model was not to use a third party provider, which is common, or hire um, a university um, in country to organize the week long events, but instead to leverage my network, my colleagues network, <clears throat> and to use several universities for a one-week visit um, to organize lectures and site visits for our students, 
uh, to meet with leading academics, business executives, political leaders, community leaders, journalists, and more. So I reached out to several universities to maximize the experience for my students, as well as to further their network, mine, and the name recognition of George Mason University. So using South Africa as an example, um, I work with the University of Pretoria, the Cape Town Business School, and University of Stellenbosch, all to organize a week-long trip there. Then March of 2020 rolled around, and COVID shut down the game. So we had to create new ways to offer our study abroad experiences as part of our students' international education um, during COVID-19's travel restrictions. So, dedicating more than half my life to internet uh, in international education, I put my thinking cap on quickly and um, immediately started to consider how virtually we might be able to provide something meaningful <coughs> and that would also um, invest in our students' development of uh, personal improvement and in our, in our cultural, in our cultural uh, and our personal problem solving um, increase their curiosity and self-awareness in the world. So uh, since March of 2020, we have offered seven uh, virtual classes, and there have been some surprisingly unintended consequences. And I believe that's what I was asked here today to share with you. So taking Africa for, as an example, it would have been impossible to design a pan-African in-country study abroad program that covers a continent of 50 plus countries and a lion mass three times the size of the United States. But with Zoom, we were able to do just that. In fact, far from the gloom and doom often attributed to Africa from the West, we were able to highlight the vibrancy of Africa and the ingenuity driving African solutions to African problems. With Zoom, we were able to schedule incredible lectures, affording the students the unprecedented opportunity to hear from top African thought leaders and visionaries including senior policymakers, academics, cultural leaders, innovative, innovators, artists, activists, and more. Some examples included the chief economist of the African Export-Import Bank, the ambassador of the African Union, the director of industrialization of the African Development Bank, the director of the African Center for Disease Control, the CEO of the Rwandan Governance Board, the head of global partnerships at Flutterway, CEOs of the... Uh, the Dangote Foundation, the Paramount Group, Feeding a, Plant, a Healthy Planet, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, and CEO of Africa 50, just to name a few. And we were able to include African students to join our classes. First started with my colleague at the University of Pretoria and her honor students, and then we added students from the University of Rwanda, and each first virtual class continues to grow. Uh, my students taking these virtual programs not only toured the continent, um, learning and engaging with Africans leading the charge, to also seeing life across the fascinating continent with their student counterparts. Our U.S. and African students were assigned into small groups where they worked together throughout the course in debriefing sessions to discuss not only the initiative presented that day, but also to broaden the scope and discuss related issues in other programs throughout the continent. In these small breakout sessions, they worked together through their Global North and Global South perspectives, on a variety of assignments and course materials. And finally, on a group project that they jointly presented, obviously via Zoom, at the end of the course. And we've been able to share these joint projects domestically and also with the embassies of all the participating countries. Um, since then, we've also started a library initiative, the library and catalog, um, the Zoom presentations and the interaction with the students that we've had from our classes abroad. Personally, it's been an incredibly rewarding to see the relationships fostered. Uh, many of our students having since taken jobs in related fields um, or completed uh, internships in Africa, and one even traveled to Africa for her honeymoon. <laughs> um, before I close, I wanted to add one more unintended benefit of these virtual classes. These study abroad programs offer a real diversity of voices. For the Africa course, all the speakers were African. As for our U.S. students, about two-thirds of each of the classes were comprised of minority students. And for several of our black students, and particularly our African students, they talked about how the course was truly transformative. Um, as at my university, as well as other institutions, you know, working hard on improving equity, diversity, and inclusion programming is, uh, is a top priority. 
And these classes also aid in giving an international experience to a student that may not have the means to pay for travel or the time to take off work, or as in the case of the DACA students in the United States, the opportunity to leave the U.S. borders. As President Biden said yesterday, the U.S. is all in on Africa and all in with Africa. And I'm excited to continue partnering with African <coughs> institutions to better educate our leaders and workers of tomorrow. So thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. So we'll cut back questions after my, uh, my remarks. Uh, but one of the questions I was going to ask you even before I, I start is where, why this is not on the <laughs> I mean, you know, Victoria, Cape Town, yeah. but we'll come back to that later. <laughs> what I thought I would do is to look at partnerships through the eyes of the Africa Center for the Study of the U.S., uh, because the center epitomizes actually what we call partnerships that we are trying to forge here. Uh, the University of the Midwaters Rand established the center in 2018 uh, for the objective of really bringing the U.S. Uh, to African audiences. Uh, Africa had been studied for many years in the U.S. So there was a feeling that uh, setting up a center that studies the U.S. from Johannesburg would give us some African perspectives, some African voices on, on the U.S. So, the, so we started in 2018. Uh, when we started, the only Africa center that was actually looking at the U.S., systematically uh, was a, a, there's a center in the Maghreb by the Rabat International University. Rabat International University is a very small university created by a Moroccan diaspora uh, and they have a center for the study of the U.S. in the Maghreb. Uh, but when they started, uh, so they started before us and then we, you know, at the second one, actually on the continent, the first one in Sub-Saharan Africa to have a center of, of this nature. The key objective is uh, one to forge partnerships uh, with African institutions that are working on the U.S. And you'll be surprised, there's a lot of teaching of U.S. courses in a lot of African universities. Uh, and so we thought as a center, when we begin to develop interest in the study of the U.S., will be building uh, linkages and partnerships with these institutions across Africa. And I think as we speak now, uh, we have a, a center for the study of the U.S. actually modeled on our center at the University of Pretoria. Uh, we just came out last year. And there is a new center that was opened in Nairobi, the Africa Center for the Study of the U.S. at the University of Nairobi. Nairobi in the diplomacy training program. And uh, by next year, we should have probably another two in Dar es Salaam and in Senegal. So the, the issue was how do we begin to build interest and knowledge and research around the US uh, in African institutions. So that was one of our objectives. The second one, of course, was to build partnership with our natural partners which are U.S. institutions uh, that work on uh, Africa broadly. And uh, we know that there are African studies programs in almost most major U.S. institutions. So those are going to be very natural partners and we worked uh, with uh, our colleagues, Krista here, and uh, in fact, USC was on board from day one, and I'll explain why USC was important. The other component about the Africa Center, uh, the Africa Center for the Study of the U.S. is that uh, we needed partnerships that were speaking to our very priorities. Uh, and I think this is one of the issues I want to bring to the table. The thematic partnerships are important, uh, particularly if you have within our university are studying and doing research uh, with U.S. institutions. What are, what are you actually trying to research? that would make you attractive to some other institution in the U.S. So I'll just go through some of the big themes that we've been trying to focus on. And the first one, which was public diplomacy, is a huge area. And that's why we began to work with uh, the University of Southern California 
and uh, we did quite a number of events with them. Uh, in fact, during our launch, we invited them to Johannesburg to be part of the discussion on what is public diplomacy and how can we engage around issues of public diplomacy. Within the larger public diplomacy area, uh, we are also uh, focusing on the role of cities in international relations. Uh, and this is important because uh, Lorna Johnson uh, from the Sister Cities International is here with us and at some point we will give her an opportunity to speak about the big conference uh, that we are hosting alongside, uh, alongside with the Sister Cities. We have two conferences, one in Johannesburg and then there is a convention of the Sister Cities International uh, in Cape Town in February. So we've been doing research around that area, and that's how we were able, in fact, to begin to build natural partnerships with Sister Cities International, which has done a lot of work in that area. The other component of public diplomacy has been digital diplomacy. Again, during COVID, it gave us an opportunity to begin looking at what, what is the role of the uh, digital, digital uh, technologies in, uh, in diplomacy. So we have quite a number of events there and we have a robust program around one of uh, the diplomacy in US-Africa relations. The third component is the diaspora. Uh, so we've been looking since we started at the role of the what we call the new and the old diaspora. Uh, and we have quite a number of events and that naturally allowed us to begin to reach out to institutions such as Howard, which we worked with from day one, and other HSBCUs that are dealing with important issues around uh, the diaspora and Africa. And we have a, a program, therefore, that focuses on the new and the African the diaspora. The other area of uh, partnerships has been U.S.-Africa relations, building on my interest uh, in U.S. foreign policy, uh, and that has also been able allowed us to begin to talk to or to build partnerships with the institutions that are actually looking at the, the role of the United States in Africa. And we have partnerships with Ambassador Ray, who is here from uh, at the the Foreign Policy Institute in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, it's important, therefore, that we build uh, that capacity around how does the U.S. engage uh, Africa on the foreign policy. Uh, and there is, I think I brought uh, one of the books that we did, uh, we did last year on the Biden administration in Africa. It's available also online for people who would be interested. Uh, in the other area that is helping us to build partnerships is an area we call U.S.-China uh, Digital Competition in Africa. And uh, we've been trying to build research around that area. And we work in, with institutions such as uh, 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 Michigan State University, which has uh, a very strong uh, China-Africa program. Uh, and so, and we are trying to broaden uh, work with some Chinese institutions also who are doing that kind of that kind of work. The Ford Foundation office in, in Beijing actually is working on those areas, so we've been able to build uh, those partnerships. Finally, I just want to mention the role of U.S. businesses in Africa, and the, the, the last session of uh, of today will be looking at an initiative that we started a couple of years ago, which is uh, the role of US businesses in Africa, particularly in corporate social responsibility. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. But I just want to say it has been one of the areas that we've been able not just to engage with uh, academic institutions uh, in the US and in Africa, US, uh, US, business, uh, uh, US business schools and African business schools but we've also begin, it allows us to begin to talk to uh, uh, US companies, uh, particularly in places in South Africa where you have 600 US companies in town. And we've engaged with that dialogue. 
So uh, the other area of uh, of exchange of the of the, the, the center is uh, exchanges with the U.S. institution, and we've been inviting scholars uh, from the key U.S. institutions to come to South Africa and speak on any topic of their choice. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, I think just before COVID, we had uh, a scholar, Namata Blyden from GW here to come to speak uh, in Johannesburg. So this is also one area that we think will be important as we forge our partnerships with African institutions, scholars and academics and, and policy makers who want to speak about GS African relations. So let me stop here and just this I just thought I would give you a, a, just as, as a, a snapshot of what we've been trying to do in this very area of building partnerships using that institution. At this point, I think what we need to do is to take some questions uh, and then we can um, uh, have a good discussion before we move on to the next session. The ground rules are that you introduce yourself. Uh, and then ask your question, starting with... Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Gregory Simpkins with Morgenthau Sterling Consulting. Thank you. Gregory Simpkins with Morgenthau Sterling uh, Consulting Company. Uh, you mentioned innovation uh, in Africa, and certainly universities in Africa have been turning out innovators for a long time. Unfortunately, when they get out of school, there are very few companies ready to hire them. So many of them join brain drain, or their talents are wasted as they try to eke out a living, or they enter into, shall we say, less uh, legal occupations. What can be done uh, and what should be done to provide for gainful employment or entrepreneurship by all of these graduates from African universities? Are we taking one question at a time? Or do you... Yeah, no, I think let's take a few. Uh, yeah, let's just go. Let's take a few. Uh, good morning, uh, esteemed panelists and colleagues. My name is Denise Kirkpatrick. I am a Foreign Service Officer. Currently, I am the Senior Advisor at the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. It is the oldest bipartisan foreign affairs uh, commission in the U.S. government. I am the first black woman uh, to be in this position. And in the history of this commission, it's had three African-Americans, John Hope Franklin, who has connections to Howard, the president of Tuskegee University, and the, first, the second African-American ambassador. My question is on university partnerships. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear Dr. Johnson mention that the US government has a role to play. I agree with you. But I also agree it's even more important that universities and civil societies hold the U.S. government accountable to ensure they have the right people and resources in the positions to carry out the new programs, such as the Africa Diaspora Council and now this university partnership. In 23 years, the United States government has not seen an African-American in a senior decision-making policy role in the Undersecretary for Public Affairs and Public Diplomacy, which houses the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. The last senior official was Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas in 1999. So given the topic of partnerships, inclusion, bringing in HBCUs to be a strategic partner, how can we do that in the absence of particularly African-American leadership in these very critical decision and policy making spaces. At the moment, we have an African regional service in Paris that caters, that supports our Lusophone and Francophone office. We have a public affairs office here in Washington, and we have no African American leadership in public diplomacy. This has been for 23 years. So then I turn it over to civil society and university institutions to engage in dialogue and encourage uh, State Department leadership to focus and, and, and recruit more uh, dynamic officers of color to serve in these roles. Because without that presence, I think it's going to be quite difficult to advance some of these issues. Our commission will be putting out a report 
in 2023 on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we operationalize that in public diplomacy abroad. Um, and I encourage you to look at our annual report because we include the statistics um, since 1945 of how the U.S. government is spending, how much money we get for African public diplomacy, how we're spending it, where it's effective, and how we could, could do better. So my question to you um, with this knowledge, how do you see, if you could elaborate, particularly Dr. Johnson, on um, how the U.S. government could play a role in, in framing or shaping university partnerships? Thank you. And the lady behind you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so starting with my introduction, it's going to be long. <laughs> my name is Emilia Miki, and I prefer to be called Emily. I'm from Cameroon. And why I say my introduction will be long is because it will also be a success story of U.S.-Africa partnerships. So I am President Obama's niece, and how did I become his niece? <clears throat> Um, I am an Obama African leader, and when we met with President Obama in South Africa in 2018, I had the opportunity to ask him if I could call him Uncle Obama, and he said yes. So I became his niece. And prior to that, I came to the U.S. for the first time in 2017 for the Mandela Washington Fellowship. And right next to me is Professor Otiso, whom I met in 2017, and we're meeting today after five years. And oh, that was all thanks to the Young African Leaders Program that President Obama launched yearly. And that gave me a trajectory in my work. And when I say my work, it's because I run a nonprofit organization in Cameroon called the Denise Mickey Foundation and the Social Enterprise. So being a young African leader, it was my first opportunity to the US for a US government funded program. And I was at Bowling Green State University, where Professor Otisu is a professor. And that was just one of the success stories of that engagement, because since then, my organization has had a lot of successes, partnerships, recognitions, and value added to the work we do. Now, my worry is, despite all this recognition and awards and everything that comes to it, being a civil society leader, being a young one for that matter in Cameroon, it's difficult to fully engage in partnerships because of existing, I would like say, bureaucratic procedures that limit our partnerships. For instance, I may want to partner with a university for a study abroad program, which is one of the things I discussed with Holy Green State University in 2017, but the procedures are so limiting to follow up or even get that done. Um, sometimes you want to apply even just for grants, as it's a young civil society, there are too many demands. Oh, do you have good accounting reports, audit reports? So for African young leaders, we have a lot of challenges because we are brought to Africa and other countries to see a possible opportunities to engage. But when we try to make the engagement, we are limited because we asked so many documentations, structures that as young Africans, we don't have. So what is being done to break these barriers, to give us access to partnerships and possibilities? Another challenge is for someone like me who is really pushing hard to break through, it becomes challenging. The first success I had after pushing through was through the Obama Foundation where I was able to incorporate my social enterprise in the US in 2019. But since then, I cannot even get documentation to push through to even get a bank account because you need an IT or a social security number. I don't want to stay in the US. So sometimes I come here and I'm here for three days Why? because the ideology is everybody in Africa wants to move to the US. Sorry. And that is all it is. Like everybody thinks I'm coming here, I should stay here and get like asylum, get all of those processes. So those processes work. But for someone like me who isn't interested to stay here permanently, I cannot move through. You apply for IT, you need to prove why you need it. You apply for social security, your visa is either B1 or B2, and you can't get it. So you can't open accounts, you can't do businesses. So what are those procedures to help us as young Africans? Because President Biden also spoke about the fact that they have to build young Africans and build their capacities. So those are the challenges I wanted to highlight that we need 
as leaders leading within the context of Africa and living in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have uh, this gentleman here, uh, and then we can go back to, or maybe we'll just wrap up because we are running out of time. If you could just get all the questions. My, be short. Yeah. My name is Christopher Emanuel, and I'm a proud graduate from the University of Southern California. And I yeah. currently work with, I don't know, <laughs> I work with the African Diaspora Development Institute. And I just had a quick question to ask um, doctor, the doctor on the end there that said that it was an old diaspora term and a new diaspora. I was wondering if you can elaborate on that. Because since I've been at the conference, I've kind of heard a little uh, disappointing divide and conquer type of a scheme. And the other thing I wanted to say here uh, with this young lady, the first speaker, you were talking about the um, outcomes that were kind of dismal. And I just wanted to state that uh, the African leaders came to the United States with no agenda, no expected outcomes, no deliverables. So you come here and you're being talked to. So what do you expect? That's it, short and sweet. I brought it in for a landing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's have those two hands up, and then that will be the end for this session. We need to complete. Uh, we'll have more time to raise those kinds of issues in the next session. Uh, oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting this uh, session. My name is Darius. Uh, I'm with the US African Institute. It's a grassroots. Uh, organization that promotes the relationship between Americans and Africans uh, through public diplomacy and, and education. Uh, someone was talking about you know, meaningful participation of you know, the diaspora. You know, when I say, when I say the diaspora, African Americans and also uh, uh, the African, I mean, the recent, I'm, I'm a refugee from, from Ethiopia, you know, I think, for which you know. Um, so that's the, so there ha we have to see our people at the table. So there has to be a meaningful, thank you so much, brother, uh, for uh, that question. And, and the way the United States view Africa through the lens of security and, and uh, geopolitical you know, you know, rivalry, you know, uh, China and then Russia, and also the US government, you know, anti-democratic you know, behaviors. Well, here at home, you know, we just had uh, an attempt to coup, right? A few years ago, and also, Towards you know, African countries in you know, all these sanctions. You know, there was a sanction uh, against you know, the Mozambique you know, people. And there is a lot of you know, crisis. You know, where, you know, someone was talking about you know, food, food, you know, food security. And the people are suffering. And also in Ethiopia, right, recently, you know, the United States government just you know, removed uh, the country you know, from, from AGWA, the African Growth you know, and an Opportunity Act. So what should be the role of you know academic institutions, universities, you know, college in addressing you know the US government in anti-democratic you know, behavior? Because you know, we have also a lot of issues here, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, you know, anti-blackness, racism. So what should be the role of you know our institutions here? Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we can have the last one. Um, so thank you. I have a little bit of a hope. So I'm Dr. Jill Humphreys, and I actually teach in African universities. The second part of my career is only teaching in African universities. I've been teaching 20 years in the United States. So um, I was an ambassador, distinguished scholar in Ethiopia, teaching at Bahadar and Arnold Minch universities. And most recently, I just returned as a Fulbright specialist teaching at Fort Hare University. Um, and over the past, Fort Hare University in South Africa, which is the first college that educated African nationalist leaders in Southern Africa. So my question is twofold. One, um, I see that there's sort of a, a bias. You talked about um, inequality within the universities that you may select to build partnerships. So I hear Stellenbosch, Ritzwaterslan, and Pretoria, but I don't hear Fort Hare University and the other 10 historically what they call um, black universities. Or And so my question is, is that a function of people sitting in a room and not being aware that there is a need to also focus on the HBCUs in South Africa because they have a different set of institutional and structural, I have to tell you this, having worked for issues than predominantly white institutions, right? And the majority of black South African students attend HBCUs. And then my second question has to do with the institute, which I'm very aware of because I'm currently doing some research on 
the role of cities and local governments in particularly economic development because the U.S. State Department just developed its first subnational diplomacy department. This is historical, folks. And the reason why it's historical, particularly for those of us in the diaspora, is that the majority of black folk are in the local levels, not in the State Department at the federal level. So my interest is, to what extent are you looking at circular development? It's not simply enough to, quote unquote, invest in Africa. There's also a responsibility to also invest and work with cities, inner cities here in the U.S., where there's large black populations. And so I'm looking at this circular development notion that Judd Davenport actually wrote about in his report. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make an exception to that side. Uh, this will be the last, then we can now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Yavin, I'm from uh, the, uh, the Washington, D.C. Mayor's Office on African Affairs. So, uh, as I represent the African community in Washington, D.C., I have a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, is there any, uh, as you know, uh, education is so expensive in the United States. So, is there any possibility to have uh, an I mean, affordable education system in here, especially when actually giving a backup to our community or our African diaspora in the United States? The other one is, uh, what about partnering with African diaspora initiatives, just like the U.S. African Institute and others, those actually exist, I mean, uh, reside in the United States? And my last question is, we are very much eager just to partner with you guys, as actually we reside in the capital of the United States. So how would we partner with you? Thank you. Darren, thank you very much. And I think what we need to do this time is to go back to the panel so that we can uh, answer some of the questions where we can. And then we have to break because we have uh, other sessions coming up. Krista, if I could start with you. Those were all great questions. Obviously, we won't, we won't get to all of them. But I think the first question really for me, and I, I actually had some <laughs> as I was reflecting on this, there's, a, I think, a whole nother set of um, challenges there around workforce development, accreditation of African institution, institutions. As far as I know, I think there's, a, there's a, in Kenya, there's the United States the university, the university. International University, right. Yeah. This is the only institution that I know on the continent that has American US accreditation, right, which then gives it a, a degree of I think leverage in terms of their their graduates going out on, onto the job market. And I, I just say to say the issue of accreditation is a challenge, the issue of visa programs, I mean even the the, 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 the young lady here is I think indicative of really where we are now, <coughs> not just on the, on the part of Africans but even in the diaspora. We need to have a more flexible visa system on both ends because our, our colleague Bob Wehesa is stuck in, in Kenya because of um, passport and you know, issues. So the mobility of, of people I think is really key in terms of in terms of ad addressing the dream brain issue too, because people don't necessarily want to come over here and stay here forever if you give them opportunities to have you know, kind of more mobility. So there's any number of, I think, air issues around that, which are maybe more bureaucratic issues, if you will, or just or even policy issues. Um, but your, your question also for me raised the issue of the importance of lifelong learning. I think the model, I mean, the U.S. institutions, high institutions of higher education, we, we are beginning to realize, but I think we really need to understand the, the new modalities of learning that exist and that are going to need to exist to keep up with the demands of the, the modern workforce. One of the things that we do, so, so you know, it's not just, you know, kind of getting degrees, but it's, it's, it's having professional development training, uh, summer institutes. The fact of the matter is, too, that if you come out with a computer science degree two years ago, that information is going to be obsolete today, right? You know, so you need to have that kind of um, uh, continuous training. Institutions of higher education are well positioned to do that. We had two summaries, summer institutes, I'll plug our own thing, one on um, this summer, 
uh, in collaboration with Bits University School of Business on uh, women and entrepreneurship, which was a big success. We offered it free. I mean, this is a virtual, you know, kind of training that we offered. It was a three-week program that we offered um, free virtually, and the majority, of course, of participants in that institute were on from on the African continent, as is should be. Right? I mean, that's wonderful. And then we also had a, a similar summer institute on U.S. Africa policy. So anyway, thinking again about maybe the modalities, right, of um, of um, of our um, teaching is important. Uh, we're going to run out of time, but Denise's question is just so, uh, of course, relevant and important as well. Um, you know, gosh, I, we do need to hold uh, USG's uh, uh, feet to the fire. I mean, I do have some ideas, I guess, in terms of, you know, kind of how, what is the, how can we frame you know, if I'm talking about this kind of the larger kind of ecosystem, there just needs to be a lot. The U.S. government can help us be much more um, coordinated around this. We have the White House initiative on HBCUs, but I'm sitting here at Howard and I'm having to read about what Morgan State is doing in you know South Africa now, et cetera, et cetera. So we just need way more kind of coordination. It would be wonderful if we could, you know, kind of find ways to do that. I'll stop there. I think since we only have a couple more minutes yeah. left, you had several really important questions directed to you, and I'll be around here during the break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, there was a question on uh, on on diaspora. Uh, the distinction between the old and new is actually just uh, uh, a distinction that we're trying to make. That there is a group of Africans uh, who came here in the sixties and some from the 50s, who can be uh, distinguished from the older diaspora. Uh, that distinction, if it's problematic, <laughs> we, we could talk about it. But there, there was just that assumption that there is a huge population of new Africans. Kwame <laughs> 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 yeah. okay. yeah. Nkrumah said, as long as you're black and an African, you are African. Mm -hmm. so that's the diaspora. Yeah. Yeah. Marcus Darby. Yeah. Marcus yeah. Darby. Yeah, so we can uh, yeah we can debate that, but I, I, I like I like the fact that you raised it actually as, as a problematic issue because we have not really thought clearly about it. But thank you very much. On the subnational diplomacy, the role of cities. I think Lona is here; she will give us a presentation later. But I just want to say that uh, the cities are emerging really as a very key entry point, uh, not just for diplomacy but also for other other issues and I think that's why cities have been managed in that in that respect as important players in, in US Africa diplomacy. And that's why we are trying to focus on it. I haven't looked at the subnational uh, somebody was telling me about this if this week I did, the subnational document. Uh, the document on sub subnational diplomacy but I think it fits into the larger picture of how, how we engage actors other than than states. There was a question about the African agenda, which I really like, uh, which is that, uh, and this is not very new, uh, African countries go to these summits uh, without an African voice. And so they come here, they go to Beijing, uh, and they are speaking in disparate voices. And I don't know how we, we overcome this. We've been pushing for what you call how to galvanize African voices. Before you go to this, they didn't consult the diaspora when they came. They need to consult the diaspora. So there's, we need to do more work in that area in getting uh, what you call the African agenda uh, on top of uh, these kinds of summit. Otherwise, they they come here and uh, I think we are speaking in very different voices uh, because we have no real clear position. There's need for work in that area, and I agree. I think on this note, let's take a quick break, maybe five, uh, there's coffee at the back, uh, five to ten minutes, and then we can co recongregate for the second session. I want to thank our speakers, Krista and Michelle, for serving our God.